Well, good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today we feature our ongoing series of programs with experts from the Vermont Cancer Center at the University of Vermont and Fletcher Allen Healthcare. The Cancer Center experts help provide you with the most reliable and up-to-date information on the symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of a variety of cancers. Our focus today is on central nervous system cancer, which includes brain cancer. Joining me to begin are two guests. Dr. Stephen Emmons of the Cancer Center is a medical oncologist at Fletcher Allen, and his Cancer Center colleague is Dr. Paul Pinar, who is a neurosurgeon at Fletcher Allen. So Stephen, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about central nervous system cancer? So um, as per the slide we're gonna see, uh, includes the tumors of the brain, and also includes tumors of the spinal cord, more commonly the brain. Uh, which includes the cerebrum and cerebellum. Mm -hmm. And so what do we know about this kind of cancer? Um, it has um, a lot of side effects up front, can be associated with um, headaches and confusion. Um, as far as how common it is, um, there's around 23,000 people per year who have um, brain tumors that have been found, um, usually on scans. Um, about half of those tumors are glioblastomas, um, of the gliomas rather, and uh, metastatic cancers are tenfold more common than primary central nervous system cancers. Mm -hmm. And so you said mostly when this happens, when someone comes to you, they've had some kind of either experience or some kind of symptoms mm -hmm. um, before coming to you. What, what sort of is a usual trigger or a symptom for this kind of a cancer? Patients often have headaches up front, uh, sometimes confusion, uh, sometimes a seizure can set things off. Usually these symptoms continue to be progressive and do not improve and usually they go to the primary care physician or go to the emergency room and then uh, imaging is completed which shows a, a mass and that usually sets things off as far as further evaluation. We can think of these as really two separate categories, a global set of symptoms such as balance problems, memory problems, headache, and a focal set of symptoms such as you might see from a stroke, that is weakness on one side or a speech problem. Is that, does that make it kind of tricky to diagnose because those are similar symptoms for other medical issues? Yes, certainly, and we rely on the imaging to really get our first look at what's really going on with the patient. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier about um, you know, some of these symptoms, maybe a person might think it's something else, and may delay getting one of those images. Does that necessarily mean that the outcome of their treatment is going to be worse? In general, I don't think so. I don't think the outcome changes all that much if one is talking about a delay of, uh, say, two or th even three months for this sort of tumor. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I suppose it all depends on where the tumor is found, but what happens next once the tumor is, is identified? Uh, usually the first step is the neurosurgeons will evaluate the patient and a decision is made to, to biopsy, usually if possible, or mm -hmm. resect one or the other, unless it's in an area such as the brain stem where that's not possible, then we rely on the imaging alone. But usually a biopsy, resection is completed, and then after the people, patients heal, um, they come to the attention of the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist. By resect, we mean remove. Yeah. yeah. And so, but not all tumors are alike, I assume. Correct. There, there's a lot of variability in how these tumors behave, even in the same classification. Interesting. And so, what's the difference between a primary and a secondary tumor? So, uh, a primary tumor is a primary central nervous system tumor, so usually gliomas or other types of cancers that started in the uh, central nervous system. A secondary tumor is from another site or the term we use is metastatic. And our therapies are so much better now from a medical oncology standpoint that the um, secondary tumors are showing up more and more uh, in one of the sites where they don't normally show up or a sanctuary site. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, in the end, secondary tumors are 10 times more common than primary cancers, CNS cancers or central nervous system cancers. You said but. something that's kind of confused me. You said you're doing such a good job, but then more of these tumors are showing up, the secondary tumors. So we're doing a better job medical oncology wise mm -hmm. with say breast and lung 
I mean, good job's a relative word term sometimes. Um, so what's happening with therapy, we have better options than we did before. And because of that, the cancers are showing up in sites they didn't show up previously because the patients would pass away because of the lack of therapeutic options. Got it, okay. Yeah. What are some of the risk groups, or are there risk groups for this kind of cancer? Um, so with central nervous system uh, cancers, it's slightly more common in men than women. Um, benign tumors such as meningiomas uh, are actually slightly more common in women than men, but those are typically, those are not malignant cancers, and in general the options are either just leave it alone, which is what we do the vast majority of the time, or occasionally if people are symptomatic, they'll be removed. It's important to note, and many patients ask this, that environmental factors such as smoking or even head injury, which is very common, are not risk factors for developing these types of tumors. Huh. What are some of the risk factors? The only one that's known clearly is uh, ionizing radiation. Um, there's some rare genetic syndromes that can be associated with brain tumors. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is there's no strong evidence associating cell phones with brain tumors. Well, that's what a lot of people are yeah. asking. In general, most of the studies have been negative. There's been a couple studies from Europe which give a flavor, but there's been no strong evidence that associates the two. And, and I know that's a common conversation I have with patients. The, the kind of radiation that you did mention that is a risk factor, where does that come from? Um, the high dose ionizing radiation, sometimes with radiation oncologists when they're doing uh, their therapies, um, uh, atomic bomb experiments, that type of thing, or Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If, high we, dose if we can say in the old days, radiation used to be used to treat ringworm, and a lot of the data that, about brain tumors comes out of that population group. Interesting. Um, are there warning signs that people should be aware of? I mean, we talked a little bit about seizures. So in general, the warning signs are often very nonspecific. Headaches, more commonly in the morning. Um, generally feeling not well. Nausea, vomiting. Um, then more uh, is the tumor advances, neurologic deficits, weakness in the leg or an arm, and seizures. And that's not uncommonly. Patients will kind of think they're not. These symptoms are nonspecific because we all have headaches. Right. And then an event happens. And usually in the emergency room or occasional primary care doctors, the the scans are done and that's really what sets everybody off with the next step. And it sounds like there's sort of a long time to have this develop. I mean, does it, does it just hit at once? Hey, usually weeks. Most Most patients patients an event. have symptoms yeah. for weeks, two to three months yeah. uh, before coming to attention. Okay. Well, joining us now is Dr. Havala Gagne. Dr. Gagne is a radiation oncologist with Fletcher Allen Healthcare. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Let's talk a little bit about how all of you make a diagnosis frequently starts where whoever the patient first sees, whether they're their primary care doctor or through the emergency room, and then as we've talked about some, they will have imaging, and then they'll frequently refer, refer to Dr. Panar, one of his colleagues, mm -hmm. um, for tissue diagnosis, meaning a biopsy or resection or removal of the tumor. And then what happens after that? Um, at that point, um, we work together as a group to formulate the best treatment for each particular patient. Um, any, for any cancer, the treatments are surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and we work out the best arrangement for each patient based on that person and on the particular tumor that they have. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the difference between radiation and chemotherapy, because I think some people might think that's the same thing. Sure, radiation are x-rays, they're high energy x-rays, and they're aimed at the tumor or the tumor bed, the area where the tumor was if it's after surgery, um, with the plan of uh, um, kind of killing the tumor cells or sometimes just stunning them so that they can stop growing for a period of time. Chemotherapy is a medicine. It goes in the IV generally or can sometimes be taken as a pill. It mm -hmm. circulates throughout the whole body. Um, are there non-surgical treatment options? Radiation therapy and chemotherapy would be the, the main non-surgical treatment option. So you don't necessarily have to have the surgery. But in general, the best option is to, to surgically, re surgically remove the cancer. The, the better outcomes are uh, associated with what we call a gross total resection, trying to get as much of the cancer out as possible, if not all of them. Most of the macroscopic disease, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note that most of the recent data suggests that one has to get to at least a 70 or 80 percent removal of the volume of the tumor before you start to see an effect on survival. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about um, the team approach again, because I think um, that's a really important aspect of the treatment of a person as a whole, because um, you know, this has got to be sort of stunning news when someone first gets this, um, and to try to understand what's going to be happening to them. So there'll be the surgery up front, mm -hmm. and then usually the three of us get together and make up a plan up as far as the uh, next step as far as chemotherapy and radiation. But in between, often patients need rehabilitation. So they'll go to Vanny Ellen, for example, and they'll see a physiatrist. It will be under their car care as far as strengthening and rehabilitation, and, and if there's any issues as far as talking or walking, that aspect. It would also involve uh, physical therapy occupational therapy, speech therapy. Um, it also involves uh, neuropsychology um, as far as kind of what I've always think of as the, the, the before the brain tumor and then after the brain tumor, the you, and how does that change? And sometimes we get input from the neuropsychologist often as far as, you know, what's what's the memory deficits here and other deficits. And um, then afterwards visiting nursing, of course, if it's needed. And then usually after that point in time, then usually myself and Havala will get involved a couple weeks after the surgery uh, to make decisions as far as chemotherapy, radiation together, or one or the other separate, and then chemotherapy afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how important is it to get um, input from the patient themselves as far as what they expect from their from their treatment, what they want for their treatment? Oh, it's critical. And um, somebody who's in their, say, 30s or 40s, as far as aggressiveness of care, just knowing what we do with chemotherapy and radiation, we may treat a little differently than somebody in, say, their 80s, because there are definitely effects of the radiation and chemotherapy. That's not to say we wouldn't do it, but we mm -hmm. just have a very honest conversation with people. And then as far as the grade of the tumor, that is how much of the cells where it came from, what it looks like, how aggressive we are therapy-wise and outcomes-wise. In, in terms of surgical decisions, there can be such a fine balance between risk and benefit of surgery that often it's a philosophical choice that the patient makes in one direction or the other to have it or not have surgery. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so what is the most important thing that you want viewers who are watching this program today to understand about this type of cancer? A, we work as a group as far as therapy and uh, we come together as far as what's the best therapy for the individual patient. And uh, obviously the patient's part of this decision. I mean, they're the main driver of this decision at the end. I mean, I always view myself as a counselor. Um, I mean, I always agree what patients decide, but you know, we honor their wishes. Um, but I want to emphasize this a multidisciplinary approach therapy-wise. It involves all three of us. I mean, group Dr. Pinar is critical up front, and then, then we come in afterwards, but we all work together. We actually have a monthly tumor board where we go through patients. So we can sit down together and talk about a particular patient all together in one room. Um, I think it facilitates a whole team approach when we're able to speak and have such good communication with each other. It must help the patient, too, because they're not having to either continue to, to update a physician on what's, what they've been through or you know have to hear things all over again or have to repeat themselves or even have to have repeated instructions given to them. It's, it's all, you know, you're together and you can give that information in one place. About the central nervous system cancer, is it a tough thing because it's a pretty big region of the body and a pretty important region of the body, body and complicated when you're talking about this particular nervous system? Mm -hmm. um, and then the surgery and, and other effects from the tumor afterwards, there's a effect on the person. I mean, not only just physical effects as far as weakness or whatnot or seizures, but also memory effects too and, and psychiatric effects too, depending on the site of the tumor. It's, it's a big issue. And well, it's a, one does need to emphasize that the brain is very sensitive to either physical intrusion with surgery or say radiation therapy, not so much that there are chemotherapy effects on it, but it's a very sensitive organ. And so we're always balancing risk and benefit. A lot of decisions to make. How important is it that um, a family is involved in the decision, not just the patient? I think it's, I think it's quite critical. These are, can be very toxic therapies, and I think a patient needs the support of uh, family members or other loved ones nearby to help them um, get through the treatment. And I think also part of it is it's overwhelming to have a diagnosis of a brain cancer. It's hard to take in that information, and it's always good to have an extra set of ears with you in the room for discussions and for uh, making decisions and thinking about things. 
All right, well, I want to thank you all for joining me today. It's a fascinating topic, and, uh, you know, there seems like there's just so much to learn, and, and, uh, and I thank you for joining us and giving us that information. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you. For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.